extensive reason, and gentlemen, I hope that you all still wish you favor by time, even in uh, spite of the late afternoon. Uh, and I hope you will forgive me if I do not follow to the letter uh, the title uh, of my talk, as it was given. I'm getting an echo here. If we could get rid of that, it would be help. Uh, but I will uh, ultimately uh, come to the topic of the United Nations nonetheless. I think we had an excellent discussion of it uh, under uh, my friend uh, Jorge Sampaio. And this is why I would like to start uh, with some more general and fundamental principles to link up with a very introductory lecture that Mark gave us and the, and the video we had from Professor Nye. But first to situate uh, the country that uh, I had the, the pleasure and the honor of representing for eight years, Latvia, on that uh, work of art which hung in the building of the European Council in Brussels for the six months of the Czech presidency, uh, the detail that wasn't mentioned earlier is that Bulgaria was indeed offended about the way they have been represented, I think rightly so. Uh, the uh, symbol chosen for Bulgaria, a Turkish toilet, I thought was a distinctly bad taste uh, and an example of uh, stereotyping uh, in, a, in the worst kind of way. The sort of thing that even in the name of, of artistic freedom uh, should not be encouraged. And so that it was uh, very modestly covered up uh, with a bit of cheesecloth, you see. Uh, the other countries did not complain and kept their symbols, including Latvia. Uh, we were rather happy uh, with the way we had been placed uh, on that map of the European Union, because we had been given mountains, you see. And seeing as our highest mountain is all of 311 meters, uh, we felt <laughs> happy about it. As a matter of fact, we do have downhill skiing, and, uh, and the Lithuanians, whose country is even flatter than ours, uh, come to Latvia for their skiing in the winter uh, when they can't get to the Carpathians or the Alps, you see. So everything is relative. Uh, and indeed, relativity, I suppose, is going to be one of the background themes in uh, what I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, in our introductory uh, speech here, uh, the topic of power and of diplomacy were addressed. And Professor Nye, with his definitions of hard power, soft power, and ultimately smart power, has had a huge influence. He was a regular, uh, regular invited guest at the Davos uh, Economic Forum every, every January. He has been an advisor uh, to uh, uh, the top echelons of American governments. And, uh, and it's become part uh, of, of everyday language, these concepts. As Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, has adopted the notion of smart power as being something that belongs in the armamentarium, if you like, of international relations, and she has talked about the toolbox uh, that should be used in smart diplomacy, in other words, that should include military might and power when the need arises, uh, diplomatic uh, relations, uh, of course, as a matter of course, uh, but as well aspects of culture uh, and other elements. Now, this particular toolbox that, uh, that Mrs. Clinton talks about, uh, it so happens, is available to a very large and very powerful and very rich country like the USA, who indeed have every option of picking whichever tool they feel appropriate for any particular moment in time. It is a privilege of being big and rich and powerful. It is not always available as a toolbox to smaller countries, uh, poorer countries, uh, and in any number of other situations. In those cases, there's hardly any toolbox at all, because even the resources of diplomacy uh, and of soft diplomacy require the existence of a sovereign nation. When a nation has been, say, occupied and annexed, as mine was, uh, 1940 and then again 1945, it disappears off the face of the earth and diplomacy 
is not even possible because there's no country to represent. I spent most of my life as a child of political emigres, refugees, war refugees at the beginning, who had hoped as they left their homeland that at the end of the war, Latvia, which had suffered two occupations, one after the other, from the Soviet Union and from Nazi Germany, would be given back its independence. It had been a member of the League of Nations uh, and thought that surely after the Second World War, uh, independent countries uh, would regain their independence, frontiers would be redrawn as they were. And uh, it was, uh, I must say, uh, a bitter uh, disappointment to them, not just the personal loss and suffering, but you might say their loss of faith in humanity and in international justice. Can we say radically in terms of international justice? Well, that is a question, I think, that is still very much on the table. Uh, the League of Nations, which had shown its inability to regulate international conflicts, came defunct, uh, ipso facto, with the Second World War. Its replacement, the United Nations, started out with a declaration of principles that if followed strictly and to the letter by every nation on earth would indeed ensure that nowhere on earth would you have the kind of conflicts that you saw during the first two, uh, the, the, the two big world wars uh, that it experienced and the smaller wars, uh, for instance, those in the Balkans which we had at the very end of the century, on principle, the kind of gross injustices that we still see so much of in the world, also, by now, 60 years later, should have been eliminated. We all know that in one way or another, sadly, that is not the case. However, if we had some sort of algorithm for calculating and adding up what has been accomplished in the past 60 years. And in that, the contribution, whether of individual countries uh, and their activities on the international scene, or of the United Nations as a, as a worldwide organization, I think that in all fairness, we would have to say, thank goodness such a, an organization was created, uh, that nations were able to come together with the idea that there should be law and justice in the international sphere as much as it within any country worth its name and that respects the dignity of its citizens, law and justice as well should prevail. The principle of the United Nations was one country, one vote, but right from its creation it had certain elements that skewed its functioning. It was very much a creature of the post-World War II situation, where the Allies that had divided, defeated Germany into four zones of occupation, actually made up the core of the Security Council, which took upon itself, which abrogated special powers and added, as a sort of afterthought, China to the lot. And they gave themselves very special powers of veto, so that nothing whatever could be decided in the United Nations without the approval of the permanent members of the Security Council. As you know, as time went by, it became quite obvious that the Security Council, in addressing matters of international security, uh, surely should have a larger representation of different countries. And so that now we have an inner core of the five permanent seats uh, taken by the countries I mentioned, and then, as it were, an outer core of countries that in turn, in, in sort of rotation, uh, are elected in by the General Assembly. So that there again, there has been an improvement, uh, but the construction quite frank, cannot, in imagination, be considered either 
representative of the state of the world today. Say inhabitants represented by each member of the Security Council or by any other criterion of them being there other than the historical accident of them having been in power at the moment of the creation of the organization, well, then surely uh, a Security Council uh, should uh, include Brazil, it should include India, and uh, a debatable number of other countries, uh, simply because of the size of their contribution, which, for instance, in the case of Germany, is truly considerable, uh, or in terms of the size of their population. Uh, truly, they should be there. And then again, one might raise the question, is it truly democratic or just uh, to have some countries more equal than others uh, give them a special right of veto, uh, which is not available to others? But then, of course, there is the fact of countries, all countries were not created equal. That is a fact of life. Mauritius is not in the same league as the United States of America or Russia or even Britain and France. In fact, I'm very pleased uh, to be following my, my colleague from the Club de Madrid here, President of Team, because it's not so very often that I can feel as a representative of a large country. Uh, again, all things being relative, you see, compared to Mauritius, uh, I feel pretty good, you know. 64,000 kilometers, you know, huh. It's quite a bit more than you have. Uh, even our population is bigger, so there. But in the United Nations, every single nation uh, has a seat, uh, be it a tiny um, uh, island uh, in the Pacific, very small population, be it Luxembourg, uh, with its small population, they all have a seat. Uh, Prince Albert of Monaco comes regularly to the General Assembly representing his country, uh, if country is the right word for it, uh, his principality, and, uh, and so on it goes. Within, within this large body, the efficiency with which this body has been able to address the world's problems, I needn't tell you, has been, how shall we say, of uneven quality uh, over the years. And uh, if we look at the list of accomplishments, as I say, are real and tangible uh, and quite numerous, it with a list of things that still need to be done, uh, then, of course, uh, that second list would be considerably longer. I, I was honoured by uh, the former uh, Secretary General, uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, uh, to be one of his five uh, ambassadors at large promoting the United Nations towards the end of his term as Secretary General. And uh, at the time we had occasion to look at the way various programmes at the United Nations uh, were being run. And the first thing uh, that, uh, that we noted is that the programs were created by the General Assembly as the years went by to answer this, that or the other need that arose at a certain moment. What was missing in the process was follow-up. What was missing was evaluation of what in fact had happened, um, how successful the intervention had been, what results uh, the program had produced, what it had cost in total, how effective, if you like, dollar per dollar, the investment had been compared to the result obtained. Indeed, for most of these projects, there had not been either a date for evaluation, for none of them, but neither a date of termination. So that as the years went by, you had these archaeological layers of unfinished projects piling up one over the other. And when the review was started, there were 7,000, 7,000 projects that had never been looked at and never evaluated. And the, and the cost of them to the human race, to all the nations who contribute to the budget of the United Nations, had not been evaluated. And I think that's not a way to run a business, it's no way to run a household, it's no way to run a country, and it's no way to run the world. When you have a budget in your household, you, you check, 
I invest here and I see it works, it doesn't work, I buy an appliance, is it a good one or not, do I need to throw it out, I buy another one and so on. You make adjustments. One needs evaluation. So that process when it was started, I'll give you three guesses what happened. Think about it. Think about it. What happened when the process of evaluation started? Loud screams of protest from all sorts of quarters of people who had felt quite happy with things just simply flowing along and being quietly forgotten, but somehow budget funds sort of flowing into this project or that, depending uh, on what kind of project it was, larger or smaller sums, but rather offended at the thought that somebody should evaluate them. And I think this is the climate of accountability and of transparency then, which I think needs to be worked on in the United Nations. They have responsibility for very important uh, programs, important for the specific goals for which they were created, uh, and important for the world at large, so that the nations participating who happen to be beneficiaries of such a program should recognize, I think, the logic and the reason for such evaluation who pays taxes to their own country, uh, does as well. I think it's just part of life and has to be accepted. But I said I wanted to go back to the idea of power uh, that we had been discussing. Hard power is the, well, let's start with power, period. Now think about it for a moment. The definition I think that Dr. Nye gives is very simple and very true. Power means the ability to do what you want or to enforce it on somebody else. There's really these two aspects to it. And the sense of power then is very close to that of liberty. When we say we want liberty as individuals or we want independence as countries, what are we saying? We're saying, I would like to run my life the way I decide not the way my feudal lord decides, or my neighbor decides, or uh, somebody else from across the sea, but the way I want to run it. When a country says it wants sovereignty and independence, it says, our people who live here will come together and decide how we will live, what kind of style, lifestyle we will have, how we manage our affairs. We ourselves would like to do it, and thank you very much. Uh, we, when we want help from outside, we'll ask for it. But, you know, don't give it to us against our will. It's a very simple thing. Within society, I wish to do what I want to do. And I think that's the very basis of democracy. Any individual born on this earth to have this idea that I am a free person in the sense of having the same inherent right as a human being as anybody else. That is not a question my being born into such a case where I'm going to be an untouchable for the rest of my life. Uh, it is not a case of my being born in the rich country or in the poor country. I should have, by divine right as it were, my opportunity as a human being to grow up in security, in peace, not starving from hunger, not being attacked by others, and on top of it, the ability to grow and develop any talents that I may have and to develop them and to put them to my own to my own welfare and satisfaction but hopefully for many people they find that their biggest satisfaction comes from using talents that are useful to others. I think if you ask yourself or others what makes me happiest in the world is to see somebody else needs me. To, be, to get something that you want, to be well fed, to be dressed, to have a roof over your head. I remember as a child dreaming about this as we were fleeing from my country. The idea of having a roof over my head, of being in the warmth, of having something to eat. There comes a point where these are primary needs and you wish you could have them. But once the primary needs are satisfied, Maslow's pyramid takes effect and you have other needs. And among these needs is then to balance Use whatever gifts you have, but hopefully to see that they are of some interest and good to others. Living all by yourself, alone, on a solitary island like Robinson Crusoe, 
I think is not most people's idea of, of happiness uh, and, and the ultimate achievement. Quite the contrary. Uh, throughout ages, on small islands, as a sense of punishment for something. Starting with the Romans and ending with Napoleon, exile on a small island has been seen as, as fate almost worse than death. We're social animals, uh, to be an interaction, we like our uh, offerings, if you like, appreciated by others. But our freedom to do what is its board? It stops with the freedom of somebody else. And this is, of course, the biggest challenge in society. How can I grow, I as an individual, and become, reach my full potential, become what I was meant to become or what I could become without stepping on your toes, without taking something away from you, uh, without hurting you, and vice versa. This sense of interconnection, of reciprocity, of mutual benefit, this is the very basis of society. Human beings have survived as a species because just like their primate ancestors, they ran in groups and in groups they gathered their food together and they shared their food and like until very recently the Inuit of northern Canada, when a hunter caught a seal, that seal was divided evenly among all uh, the family uh, and the closest uh, neighbors because it is so difficult. Uh, to hunt in such a, a climate and survival depends on sharing when you have uh, got some game. The very basis of human society then starts as this idea of sharing, of re reinforcing each other and of mutuality. But also, way back into I think uh, as far back as we can see in human history, there's also an inequality. All men are created equal as the American Constitution says, by rights, by their dignity, but not in real fact. Human beings differ in sex. As time goes on, they age and the age changes. They differ in size and weight and, and qualities and any number of dimensions. If you plotted, say, the height of human beings in any given in this room, you would get something approximating and and so normalcy, the idea of normalcy is the 50% of the curve, sort of inverted U shape. Most people fall somewhere in the middle, some are, some are at the high end. The same sort of normal distribution applies to all human qualities. It applies to such human qualities as solidarity, openness, ownership, such human characteristics as aggressivity, as plain nastiness, and even sadistic tendencies. <coughs> as a psychologist by training, I know whereof I speak. And believe you me, some people at the end of the curve, I sometimes wonder whether they belong to the same species as the rest of the curve, or whether by nature, somehow by some sort of mutation, uh, they are already off they're off the radar screen, they're off the curve, because they do not, they lack that elementary sense of identification with another human being, which normally most people, a large proportion of society, get from growing up in a family, with identifying with their parents, and therefore they feel empathy with another human being. You read a novel, you feel empathy with the heroes and heroines. You put yourself in their place, you put yourself in their place in imagination. A child hurts another and the parents say, don't do that, it hurts. And the child thinks, ah, if they hit me the same way, yes, it hurts, therefore I shouldn't do that. It's a long process of training what sociologists call socialization. A human being is not socialized at birth. It's a helpless little thing. It becomes a member of society through a process of socialization. That socialization is based on the values existing in a certain society. And these are the values that make up civilizations, that make up cultures, but the values are not fixed. They're not fixed in time, they're not fixed in place, they evolve. And the whole question is, can we 
find ourselves values, first of all, that the majority of people in the world could subscribe to? Can we accept the best of the best that have evolved in various societies, in various places, from various geniuses and great thinkers of time, as to fundamental principles that can make, make life on Earth a better, uh, better for all of us, and, and Earth a better place to be on? Can we do that? The United Nations tried to do that in their Declaration of Principles. Many other uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations have tried to do that. Henri Dunant, when he created the Red Cross, went out on the battlefield and said, here are the wounded, and more people are dying from their wounds that are directly being killed on the battlefield. So I am going to go out there, not with the flag of my country, Switzerland, but by inverting it and saying this is something that is outside and beyond the battle you are having. I want to take care of the wounded, no matter which side they have fought on, because they're human beings and they deserve care. Now, a very radical, a very new principle, universally accepted by now, and one of the elements that was adopted when the United Nations started creating the various bodies that it has, peacekeeping, the right to protect and various other elements in their programs that were started. But in the power to enforce your will on others, you do have people who are by nature brutal, nasty, sadistic. You have throughout history leaders, tribes, countries, groups, who had no other aim in life than to impose their will on others, and often to do it in a sadistic way, or to extend the size of their empire, and that has been a large part of history. The mania of grandeurs that has pushed, not just individuals as leaders, but also the groups around them and supporting them, to have ambitions that went far beyond what they could actually need and use in their life, far beyond, say, building marble palaces and having golden domes and, uh, and, and all, the, all the beauties of civilization uh, and all the advantages of riches and resource that you could possibly imagine, but simply to extend and to extend and to extend. And it's an interesting thing about the human brain that nature has sort of built into our brains certain mechanisms for breaks, when we have been active, say, a whole day like this, ultimately tonight, your brain at some point will say, it's time to go to sleep. Uh, you've had the waking phase, and that's, that's just fine, but uh, sorry, uh, we have to switch off, uh, you know, pull the switch on you, and you will lose contact with the outside world. Uh, your brain needs recuperating, uh, and it needs to sort out the information it took in during the day. The glucose in your, in your bloodstream uh, is a fantastically complicated system that self-regulating and so on and so on. Lots of things that nature has built into us. Marvelous things that are self-regulating, as long as we're healthy, of course. What it has not built into uh, the human brain, it seems, is a break, a proper cycle, either for ambition or for the need of power for people who become addicted to it, or for the need to impose your will on others. Uh, which made the case economic groupings, linguistic groupings, religious groups, etc., etc. Hard power then means getting the resources, say an armament race, where you're either going to attack the other side or you need the hard power to defend yourself. Say during the Cold War you had two sides the communist world and the so-called free world. Both sides needed the hard power, not because they meant to attack each other directly, they knew that would be suicidal, but just in case, just in case the other guy did go nuts and attack you, to be able to defend yourself. And you get into this vicious circle, you see. After the one increases armaments, the other has to increase armaments, and there's no way out of it, or is there? Well, we saw that there are various ways out of it, of course. There's always a way out. In this case, it was the fact that 
between two powers that were sort of equal, one, one kind of collapsed and lost its power, the Cold War was at an end, and you sort of turn a page and things are built on again. But the need for hard power and the necessity of having some resources of at least defending yourself in case somebody who has different ideas from you and who does not believe in the same things as you is very real and it's very much there. So hard power remains with us and I fear it will be with us for a long time. The soft power of persuasion is in a way a luxury that you can afford when you do not need uh, to have the, the hard power. Um, but there's various kinds of power. Smart power means combining the two, says Dr. Nye. But I was thinking of next to the toolbox that Mrs. Clinton has available. What do, as, as I said earlier, what do smaller countries have available? Let's say a country like Kyrgyzstan, which was not one of those that was terribly well known, was not in the news, uh, except when, uh, when they had a change of president a few years ago. Kyrgyzstan happens to be situated in Central Asia in a place which for the United States of America is of strategic importance as a place of transfer, military transport for the military effort in Afghanistan. The situation of having a US base in Manas was seen by the other uh, neighbor of, uh, of Kyrgyzstan by the Russian Federation as a bit of a, as offensive in a sense that after all this was part of the former Soviet Union. They somehow felt a sense of entitlement to it and, and thought that this American base should disappear from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, President Akiev went to Moscow I think last spring and lo and behold came back within his pocket no less than a two billion loan for his country. And at the same time, by sheer coincidence, I happened to mention that he thought that the base in Manas, uh, the, the, the lease with the Americans, should be terminated. Well, uh, in the intervening months, it seems that maybe uh, the president of Kyrgyzstan received a few visits uh, from the United States of America because it seems that, after all, the, uh, the base that the Americans are using as a transit center to be renamed the transit center will be maintained, but uh, the cost of the lease will go up somewhat, like from 17 million to 60, a slight increase, you see. Uh, plus a hundred million loan, or gift, I forget which. Um, <laughs> Not a, bad, not a bad deal, I think, for Kyrgyzstan. And where was the power? Was it hard power? Was it soft power of, of, of sweet talking and diplomacy? Negotiation, surely. Certainly negotiation, the power to negotiate, I would say. But what was the basis of the... There was power someplace. Influence there. And what is the influence? Geostrategic. Kyrgyzstan, by the simple fact of where it happens to be located geographically, and by the simple hi historical situation of what is happening in Afghanistan, had some real Trump cards, cards in its hands, and I must say, played them well. What can I say? Two billion is, is not peanuts, and, 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 you know, and the income from the basis is not negligible either. An enviable accomplishment, what can I say? My own country, Latvia, was also geostrategically situated between two very large powers after its birth in 1918 as an independent republic. It declared itself to be neutral, you see. It thought that living between two large neighbors, uh, the Soviet Union and uh, Germany, a wise thing would be not to take sides, to say we, you know, we want to live just happily with all our neighbors, not get mixed up in any quarrels. Uh, please leave us alone and let us carry on with our lives. Well, on the 23rd of August, what, 70 years ago, 
uh, the two neighbors you see got together, um, had a friendly chat, and signed signed uh, an agreement to be uh, to be allies. Uh, and they happened to be allies for two whole years, and on behalf of Hitler and of Stalin, von Ribbentrop and Molotov signed a pact with a secret protocol at the end, which split up Poland, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia between the two powers. The Soviet Union was to invade and annex one part of these countries and the Germans would invade and annex the other, the ones to extend their Lebensraum, the others to gain strategic access to the Baltic Sea. Very much in terms of what cards, you might say, these countries had in their hands, geostrategic here considerations. Alas, for the fates uh, of the people, the peoples inhabiting them, not quite the same outcome as for Kyrgyzstan, for the simple reason the two friends actually were not content with the way they had carved up their spheres of influence. Hitler uh, didn't invade just Poland, but went beyond, uh, invaded uh, the uh, Baltic uh, countries as well, pushed back uh, the Soviet troops and in fact marched on to, uh, to Moscow and to, and to Leningrad. So um, at that point, uh, of course, we had World War II in full swing and everything else uh, that happened ever since. The story uh, and the moral of the story is what? The equilibrium of power between states in the international scene is very conditional. It is a situation of reciprocity where you may have treaties, even signed official treaties, such as between Stalin and Hitler. It's no guarantee that the treaty will be followed. Hitler broke it by invading the territory that had been agreed to belong to Stalin. Declaring your neutrality is no guarantee. Latvia's neutrality was not respected by either side. And belonging to a supranational body, such as the League of Nations, no guarantee either. And I think ever since, it's not as if with the collapse of uh, the Nazi system, and then much later, half a century later, the collapse of the totalitarian system of, of the Soviet Union, it's not as if everything had been changed, it's not the end of history, it's not as if we're living in a different world, we do not. We have differences and divisions that continue to be felt. We have the divisions between the rich and the poor, between the north and the south, and increasingly uh, that divide of the civilizations that Huntington had been talking about, the civilizations uh, supposedly of Christian in origin, although by now quite largely secularized, uh, and not at all religious as they were, say, during in the Middle Ages, during the, the Crusades. And uh, the uh, rather militant uh, forms and expressions uh, of the Muslim world, which, by the way, is not at all a unified entity, but has severe divisions within it, as we see in Iraq, with, with quite bloody confrontations between the Shia and the Sunni, and there are other divisions uh, of that type. So the situation is there, and when, during the Millennium Summit of the United Nations, I saw on the program a session that was called the Dialogue of Civilizations with the President of Iran, the Ayatollah Khatami, uh, presiding it, I signed up for it. I thought, this is terrific. Uh, it's, uh, this is before 2003, you understand. I thought, this, this is a great opportunity, it's a new millennium, uh, we should be engaging a dialogue of civilizations. I myself, after my, my, my parents fled uh, my native country, had the opportunity to live in, in various uh, continents and, and in various milieus. I spent my adolescence in Morocco, a population of, of Arabs, of Berbers, of Jews, of Europeans, of Muslims and Christians and atheists. And Jews, uh, a mixture uh, of peoples, uh, an interest in this. We had a session where Fidel Castro was one of the participants and various other people. It was a fascinating uh, session with the Ayatollah Khatami delivering 
uh, a very long and involved speech in a style completely alien to, to the Western mode of thinking, but of, of most uh, quite superb intellectual quality, very interesting discussion. And after the session, uh, I didn't get a chance to speak because Fidel Castro, of course, having taken the floor, <laughs> couldn't be stopped. And he just went on and on and on. Uh, and it so happened that when the session was closed, I was one of those who never got a chance to open my mouth. Because when Fidel starts talking, believe me, uh, nobody else has a chance. But I went up to, uh, to the chairman of the session uh, uh, to express my admiration for the, really the high intellectual quality of, of, his, uh, of his presentation. Very theological, very, very, very erudite very alien to me, but at the same time uh, very interesting intellectually and, and very stimulating. And as I was approaching uh, the Ayatollah, uh, two men of his entourage rushed forward, you see, and said, please, 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 don't extend your hand to the Ayatollah. He doesn't shake hands with women. Ah, well, various ways of interpreting that are human sort of women an inferior part of the human race or, or what? At the time I was living, uh, uh, I was already president of Latvia, but I had spent a lot of time living in Canada where Canadians don't go in much for shaking hands. And I said, all right, it's fine with me. You don't want to shake hands, no problem. Um, later on, <laughs> the same gentleman come up and say, uh, the chairman of the session is inviting all the participants to a luncheon that he is giving, but please remember, do not shake his hand. <laughs> and I said to them, thank you very much for the invitation, but I also have an invitation from the women world leaders who will be quite happy to shake my hand, and I will be happy to shake theirs. So thank you, but no thank you. I will have lunch with the women world leaders. But that's not the end of the story. A number of years later, uh, in fact, in January 2007, uh, I happened to be in Davos for the World Economic Forum at the reception that the president of Switzerland typically throws at the beginning for heads of state and government. Very crowded room in one of those skiing chalets in, in the Alps. And, uh, and I see a number of people there uh, whom I know and whom I wish to, uh, to say hello to. And indeed, there is the Ayatollah Khatami with his entourage, now a past president by that time. And I thought, well, uh, I've had you know, a certain contact with him, even if I have not shaken his hand. Uh, I think it would be polite of me uh, to go up and say hello. So I, I sort of you know, try and push my way <laughs> through the crowd and, and you know, do the fish uh, uh, to try and reach the Ayatollah. As I come ahead of him, uh, the Ayatollah looks at me, sort of from a distance of about two meters, and says, Ah, oh, the president of Latvia! And he extends both arms. <laughs> and believe it or not, he embraces me on both cheeks. <laughs> so I said to myself, what has happened? <laughs> Has his interpretation of the Quran changed in the eight years? <laughs> Is it that he was never so, if you like, strict in his way uh, of interacting with other people uh, as his aides uh, imposed on him during his presidency? Has, he, is, has it finally dawned on him that I come there not as a woman, but as a president <laughs> of a country? <laughs> well, whatever the case, I say, I. Better to have friends than enemies, and better to be embraced than to be slapped on both cheeks, <laughs> for sure. I cannot say that you know, the difference was due to my charm and to my influence. Surely, I wish I could, you know, but I don't think it was the case. But it does give one hope. I think it gives one hope for change, even in positions that seem to be cast in cement, you know, etched in stone unchangeable, immutable, there is always hope that a softening of the position could come about. And this is what diplomacy, of course, is all about. Diplomacy is about, first of all, reminding the world that you are there. Hello there, world. 
I'm Latvia, you know, I'm, <laughs> remember me, uh, or have you ever heard of me? It's, that's the first step. You, you're sort of trying to put yourself on the map and, and saying who you are. And then, of course, you're trying to make friends. You say, hey, uh, you know, I, I'm not about to invade you or to harm you. I, I think we could talk to each other and maybe find something in common. And, uh, and that thing in common could be a great many things. What I have found in my travels across the world, for instance, is to find the common, the empowerment of women, which I must say has a long way to go. If I talked about the rights of nations to their independence and their sovereignty and how fragile that is in so many ways still today, then certainly the rights of women, I think, are among that list of to-do items that the world still has to tackle in terms of giving them all the regal rights in many countries and all the equal opportunities in those countries where the legal rights are very nicely enshrined and look terrific on paper, but where in real life uh, there is a difference for a variety of reasons. I remember having a meeting with businesswomen in South Africa, a very informal meeting that was called together after I had participated on a, uh, at the United Nations conference in Durban against racism and xenophobia. And these women told the stories of their lives and of how they had been the object of double discrimination. Apartheid, of course. Apartheid, which had, in many cases, kept them as sole supports of their families because their husbands had been uh, imprisoned uh, as activists for the rights of the blacks in South Africa. Uh, but also, among their own people, the prejudice against them as women, and later on their difficulties as businesswomen to even to be accepted and be given equal, equal treatment by their own people, by their own race. A double discrimination in their case. And some of them were crying and surprised at the fact that the woman from the other end, you know, from the Antipodes, from the northern end of Europe, should come down uh, to the tip of South Africa and be interested in listening to their stories and to their plight and to sympathize with them. And I think this is part also of when we talk about cultural diplomacy or soft diplomacy. It is not just saying, hello world, you know, here I am. Uh, I would like to invite you too to come to Latvia by all means. You see, I think it's a terrific place. If you haven't seen it, you must come, you know, that's one thing. But also the ability to listen to the other and to realize that we have something to share in our mutual understanding as human beings with certain aspirations, with certain dreams and hopes, and a crucial element, and this came up in the discussions earlier, respect for each other. That if I affirm you as an individual and a human being, and you affirm me, I think the human race uh, benefits, <laughs> not just you and me, but the human race and its future and its possibilities are, I think, enhanced, and our hopes for the future are enhanced as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, you who have gathered here uh, under this, uh, uh, the flag, if you like, of, of cultural diplomacy, I think that you have, each and every one of you, in your lives, this, this opportunity to push things forward in whatever field that you are, you're working in. Even a little step, even a little bit, in enhancing the sort of climate that reigns in the world. A climate where every human being is accorded equal dignity, where we can each be open to each other, where we can affirm ourselves and grow without doing so at the expense of somebody else. It's not a zero-sum game, it's a win-win situation. It takes a bit of effort and, and sometimes you have to work even a lot of effort. One has to try very hard to find the ways of creating a win-win situation instead of a zero-sum game situation. But it can be done. And people do change. And even those people who are fanatic, who are so convinced that they have the only and exclusive right interpretation of what God wants, of how the world should be, of what needs to be done, and so on. There is a way out even against them. Can we have dialogues with uh, 
with fanatics. I doubt it very much. Last spring, I, I was at the Kennedy School uh, at Harvard, and a guest lecturer there was Canon White from Baghdad, who had been the canon of the Anglican Church in Baghdad for 20 years. And somebody asked him a question, do you believe in a dialogue between the Shia and the Sunnis as a way out for the conflicts in Iraq? And he says, well, between the populations, of course, between the ordinary people, it is a possibility. But between the fanatical leaders, as I know them, and as I've known them over the years, dialogue is impossible with fanatical leaders. And so when you reach a brick wall of that kind, then there's only two ways out. One is to attack it with hard power and, and knock it down. The other is to walk around it and find some ways of speaking with others and making them lose power. Think back and even in the history of New York. When the Inquisition, when the Inquisition was set up by Torquemada and Saint Dominic and with the approval of the Pope, it said, our aim is to save people's souls, even in spite of themselves. So we may have to torture them to death or to burn them at the stake with aspen wood. By the way, the reason witches were burned with aspen wood is because it burns very poorly and the suffering is that much longer. So we torture them as much as we can, but we want to save their souls. And this went on for centuries. And this was accepted as God's will on earth and, and a fine thing to do to save people's souls. Now, eventually, and you may be interested in me, we don't have time now, but it's an interesting case about the Inquisition. How did, why did it last for centuries? What propped it up? What were the pillars and props that held it up? How did it come to fall down and why? It's an interesting study, as many others. The lesson of it, we're often told you can't draw lessons from history. I think that's not true. I think we can draw lessons from history. Not transfer, you know, directly, uh, copy exactly and so on, but inspiration, surely. And the inspiration from that is that, yes, by changing things in a system, in the environment, in the equilibrium, yes, you can, yes, you can change. It is possible. It can be done and it must be done. So, my wish to you is go and do it. God bless you. Thank you very much for this truly inspirational talk. Um, I'm Irena Kakev from Ukraine, and I will ask a question about Ukraine. You understand very well uh, the difficulties of Ukraine of having Russia as a big and interested powerful neighbor. And my question would be, what would be your best advice to the Ukrainian president who has aspirations of joining the European family of how to deal with this neighbor? Thank I have you. talked uh, both to President Yushchenko and to, and to Mrs. Timoshenko. And to both, I've said the same thing, as have many others, but alas, to no effect. And that is that if you want to bring your country in a certain direction, you must find a common understanding in, within your own country and bring the forces together. In Latvia, we had any number of governments. I, some, when I took office, the uh, uh, journalists from abroad would ask me, you change your government so often. Uh, you know, can your country be trusted? Is it very stable? I said, well, 
we are learning the ways of democracy and we're taking countries like Italy uh, as an example, or post-war France, you see, who went through a certain phase of changing governments, like one changes she uh, sort of shirts or sheets in one's bed. But we had a common aim and we pursued it and everybody signed up to it. In Ukraine, the divisions between the prime minister and the, uh, uh, and the president are, I think, very harmful to the country. I truly am sorry to see them. I was there on Maidan Square when, they, uh, when the president was sworn in. I remember the enthusiasm of the uh, Ukrainian people that they had won in the Orange Revolution, that justice had prevailed, that, that the new, new way had started for them. It, it was amazing. We were, foreign guests were driven by in, in a bus and they were all waving and, 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 and so it was such a thrill to be there. And then to see the two leaders unable to come to an agreement was deeply painful to me, and I'm sure it's deeply painful to the Ukrainian people. And it is such a great pity. Hi, my name is Sarah Imani. I just uh, want to thank you as well. And I ju have just one question. Um, what do you think about the responsibility to protect the concept? Since have you heard about it? Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was one of the elements that was a part of the package that uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan introduced, got accepted by the General Assembly, no small feat, by the way, and on which debate continues to this very day. I think uh, yesterday, uh, today, there's debate going on at the United Nations, and you can read, in fact, uh, the elements of the debate uh, on, on, the, on the Internet. Uh, it is very interesting to see various countries uh, arguing here and uh, to see who says what and why uh, as an analysis but also to see what the issues are. Uh, the first thing to note is that it is being referred to as R2P, you know like R2D2 sort of thing, <laughs> which I'm not sure helps. It sort of trivializes the thing. I think the responsibility to protect is an important responsibility internationally. We should not trivialize it by giving it uh, a silly uh, symbol like that, but that's just my personal prejudice. Uh, I understand that people are very uh, busy and, and in, in a great hurry and they can't say two words, you see it. They need three letters instead. All right. The arguments. What are the arguments? The responsibility to protect was invoked to justify interference by the United Nations in a case where a state, a sovereign state, had shown itself incapable of protecting its own citizens. Any sovereign state exists by virtue of the trust its citizens place in it to offer them elementary protection, starting with protection of life and dignity and the rule of law, etc., etc. And when there's gross inability to protect. When there is genocide going on, not by the dozens or the hundreds or the thousands, but by the millions, and the state is incapable of stopping it. Or when, as in Darfur, for five years since the United Nations have been seized with the problem, there has been no progress made. And we're told just now, these days, that the Tensions between Sudan and Chad have even worsened. How worse can they get when they're already bottomless sort of pit of, of dissensions? 2.7 million refugees, constant rapes of women, people starving, children dying. And the United Nations so far hasn't been able to intervene because the nations cannot agree on just what responsibility to protect should imply. How is it? We need debate. Meanwhile, people are being raped, they're dying of hunger, they're being displaced, their lives are destroyed. At the United Nations, the delegates are debating. How are we to balance the sovereign rights of a nation? And there are some nations say, a nation's sovereignty is the primordial thing. Nobody has the right to intervene. It's their responsibility to protect their, their, their subjects. And if they slaughter them to death or starve them to death, that's their privilege because it's not the words they use, you know, but that's what it comes out to when you're saying 
Sovereignty above all, nobody has the right to intervene. That it is a potentially slippery thing, and that you could have interference against another state's sovereignty on possibly not sufficient evidence, as we had a case, I think you will realize whereof I'm thinking. It is a debatable point, but it should not be a debate that goes on forever while people are being killed, raped, and starving to death. That, that's my personal conviction. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Abdul Rimdap, Ambassador of Nigeria in Germany. Thank you very much for the, the, the lecture you've given to us. Uh, you mentioned some uh, very interesting uh, issues uh, which uh, seem to be uh, also similar to us. Uh, you gave an example of uh, how it was difficult for you to, 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 to shake the Katami uh, when he was president of a country. But when he was a private citizen, it was a different issue. Could so be, could the, be that was the, the case. Now, this is what I'm going to, my question is going to that aspect. To the, that aspect. You see, the question of uh, which we sometimes face in Africa was the fact that, you know, the situation where you, you mentioned about your country between Russia and Germany. But the same thing here we have in Africa as a whole. It was here in, the, in Berlin when the, the Europeans sat down the table and were demarcating uh, the spheres of influence. Uh, oh, without uh, having seen the sphere on the ground. When they went there to find out that, okay, this is a French sphere of influence, this is a British sphere of influence, this is a German and so on, they found that the situation was really very difficult. So when this country had independence, they have this question of nation building. Then, then they talk about the issue of self-determination. These are now issues which are conflicting each other. For instance, in my country, we have about 300 uh, different ethnic groups. They have different cultures, different religions, different uh, languages, and so on. So we are trying to build a nation. So there's an element of coercive nature, so, so that people can learn particular language to communicate. So the issue of nation building and self-determination created some conflict. And that's why I'm saying, trying to say now that, how do you see the role of governments in promoting peaceful intercultural dialogue? Because you see, government, I'll give an example now, between, if you see Pakistan and India, these are very peaceful people, very hard, very, very friendly people among themselves. But the governments, when you see news about them, think that they are in conflict. What are the, the, the people themselves are not. 